I want to start first by really giving a lot of credit to the conference organizers because although I thought that my paper fit really well with the two that came before, I, I, you know, I have to say that the, the work that both Dan and Dermot uh, presented is so important to us as lawyers uh, trying to figure out the role of federal law in resolving municipal financial distress. Okay? And that, that is primarily uh, what I work on. Okay? In studying Chapter 9 and observing municipalities, states, and courts struggle uh, with solving the problem. And it was interesting in, in Dermot's paper when he asked, are higher yields due to Chapter 9 policy? Because I am trying to show in my paper that Chapter 9 policy is really ill-defined. Uh, when people hear bankruptcy, and, and Natalie mentioned it in commenting on Dan's paper, um, said, well, you know, the, the bankruptcy lawyers come in and they want to carve up property and sell it off, and oh, are, are we going to sell the art in Detroit? Yes. Bankruptcy lawyers do think that way because bankruptcy lawyers come at this issue uh, from corporate and individual bankruptcy. And bankruptcy law, as applied to corporations, business entities, and individuals, is fundamentally property law. Okay? It's fundamentally property law because the promises that individuals and business entities make in exchange for credit are property-based. On the other hand, municipal finance law is really not property law. In fact, in one sense, a municipality has no property, right? If you um, agree that a municipality holds property in public trust for its residents, then there's nothing and, and this is an overstatement, but there's nothing that creditors can get. So when you try to graft bankruptcy law onto a system where property that's available to creditors doesn't matter, you have a bad match, you have questionable policy, and you don't have the sort of certainty that we want in bankruptcy law. So the wholesale incorporation of bankruptcy concepts is not helpful in determining creditor priorities in municipal bankruptcy. And you know, I talk here not just about municipal bankruptcy, but municipal insolvency generally. Because as, as Dermot pointed out, and, and by the way, I think when your research is done, every state legislature needs to see it. Okay, because when you talk about contagion and differences among states, and I could tell you many more stories about what happened in Harrisburg, and um, you know that that information is just not there in the state legislatures. But um, uh, the wholesale incorporation of bankruptcy concepts in the municipal arena is not helpful in determining creditor priorities. Um, the incorporation also leads to analogies that aren't appropriate. For example, should general obligation bonds be treated as secured debt? Well, in the commercial sense, they are not secured debt. But does that matter, right? I mean, if we're trying to design a debt resolution system for public entities, maybe we shouldn't be talking about secured and unsecured. Maybe what we should be talking about are these different types of promises, the distinctions among bonds, what the market expectations are, who holds this debt, not can we shove general obligation bonds into the, cons into the security interest construct. Um, in thinking about, um, you know, what I want to say in my paper. Um, one thing, and again, as, as lawyers, we think about this, gee, what if Congress were writing on a clean slate? What would they do with Chapter 9? Well, Congress just had the chance to do that. Now, you know, none of us are naive enough to think that, you know, Congress would write uh, Chapter 9, rewrite Chapter 9 completely, but the Puerto Rico legislation was not passed under the Bankruptcy Clause authority to enact uniform bankruptcy laws throughout the states. It finds its authority under the Territorial Clause of the Constitution. So um, Congress wasn't bound by the idea of bankruptcy. Uh, 
Yet, Congress took a whole bunch of bankruptcy concepts and uh, dumped them into the PROMESA bill. Um, but several elements of that bill actually do indeed reflect municipal borrowing realities. Among them are the Oversight Board. Okay, the Oversight Board makes the decision to file for restructuring and files the plan of debt adjustment, which, as was mentioned in the comments to the last paper, actually is the case in a good number of states. In my state, in Pennsylvania, um, that's what happens. You, uh, a municipality can't file unless the state says so. And, you know, although only one city has been under receivership, and that's Harrisburg, you know, I think if it comes, you know, if, if Scranton really looks like it's going to file for bankruptcy, there most likely would be a receiver appointed first. Um, the collective action chapter in the PROMESA legislation requires the division of bondholders into pools that reflect the type of promise that backs each bond. Um, and the legislation also gives some guidance on classifying claims for plan purposes, uh, meaning plan of adjustment purposes, based on non-bankruptcy priority. Now, you might wonder, you know, who cares about this, right? One, Congress is never going to, you know, Congress is not going to rewrite chapter nine. Um, and I want to skip for a moment to something I, I know my discussant is going to say, which is, well, you know, lawyers describe case studies, they suggest normative principles, and they're, you know, they're, we really don't need any changes in the law. I want to point out with municipal insolvency and bankruptcy, the law is in fact changing all the time. We have something that is embodied in Chapter 9. Um, but there's not much in Chapter 9, right? We don't have priorities. A lot of what's absent from Chapter 9, we say, oh, well, the federal government can't do that because of the 10th Amendment. We have to leave it up to the states. So that's all very fluid. Um, states, of course, both as a constitutional matter and as a Chapter 9 matter, get to decide how their municipalities will resolve their debt problems. And states do need good guidance and good information in making a decision whether or not to permit their municipalities to file for bankruptcy. Um, you put one of Governor, former Governor Rendell's quotes up on the screen, um, and, and he said a lot of very memorable things. But you <laughs> left out what I thought was one of the more amusing things he said about Chapter 9, which was, you can't, Harrisburg can't do it because a judge will take over the city and make all of the decisions, okay? One, that doesn't happen in Chapter 9. Two, his wife used to be a bankruptcy lawyer before she went on the bench, okay? So, you know, he should have known better. Yeah, I know that's on the record. But I've said it before. Um, so um, they do need good guidance. And again, remember, you know, it's not clear really what the Chapter 9 policy is. Um, I think a lot of people in this room know that the Harrisburg parking system bonds were just cut to junk. And every day in Harrisburg, you hear people complaining about the parking because now we have to pay for it. One of the problems was nobody did before and nobody collected. Um, but, you know, now that the, the, the bonds have been cut to junk, people say, well, wait. The state should have let us file for Chapter 9. Well, I'm not sure that would have made any difference because the same people who monetize the parking system outside of Chapter 9 would have done so inside of Chapter 9. And you just had a case of, you know, who's it going to be approved by, the Commonwealth Court or the Federal Bankruptcy Court? So I want to focus a little bit on perhaps what Chapter 9 policy should look like, or what municipal insolvency um, policy should look like. Because one, states do change their approach all the time. And two, you know, we do have bankruptcy courts dealing with this. And even though people will look at Detroit and say, this means that, that um, bondholders are going to take it on the chin, remember that bankruptcy courts are not even binding on one another. Okay, so there really is not a lot of binding law in the Chapter 9, or at least binding decisional law in the Chapter 9 space. The traditional definition of bankruptcy is a method of distributing a distressed debtor's assets when there are not sufficient assets to satisfy all claims against the debtor. Again, that reflects the way in which corporations and individuals borrow. We have a, a dichotomy between secured and unsecured debt, 
bankruptcy law protects secured debt for a couple of reasons. One, the Fifth Amendment uh, to the Constitution, which says we can't take property without just compensation. Um, or the government can't take property without just compensation. Um, two, people say, well, it's commercial expectations. This is, this is just how companies and, and people borrow. Um, are security interests the only promises that bankruptcy law protects? Generally, yes. Okay? Um, but that is not the way things have to work. Okay? Bankruptcy law has not always uh, ignored state created priorities outside of property-based priorities. So in municipal finance law, there is no common pool of assets to carve up. As I mentioned before, um, we uh, consider uh, property held in public trust. Um, and municipal um, finance security comes from different types of promises. And as, as Bob Doty mentioned before, the different available pools of income. You know, are we talking general fund? Are we talking taxes? Where is this so-called security in the municipal finance sense coming from? Um, municipal finance laws, of course, also prote provide some protection for taxpayers of the municipality through debt limits and voter approval, okay? Um, then we see different priorities that come from constitutions, and although you mentioned that constitutional priorities can be set aside in bankruptcy, again, that doesn't have to be the case. And, and although in Detroit, Judge Rhodes said he was you know, not completely honoring the constitutional priority, but respecting the constitutional priority, again, that's not the way it has to happen, but we see priorities given by constitutions, by statutes, and by contracts. So what could Chapter 9 policy look like and what should we be thinking about? Um, it's important to, I, to identify what the values of municipal insolvency law are, what the goals are. And some of them are common to the values and goals of bankruptcy law as, a, as um, applied to individuals and businesses. So we want an orderly process, we want a collective proceeding, we want certainty, we want some level of uniformity because of the, the national market, we want to eliminate holdouts, and we want to eliminate debt overhang. However, there are some uh, values that are unique to public entity insolvency because services have to be continued, um, the viability of the community is, of course, important. The baseline process is not division of assets. And we also have to necessarily respect the state's um, control, and yeah, I will use the word control, over the municipal entity. So the big open question then is how can the federal process incorporate the unique values of municipal finance as an insolvency law? Do we want courts on the federal level just to completely honor state priorities? That would further certainty so long as those priorities are clear. And if you know, we keep Chapter 9 within the bankruptcy clause of the Constitution, which I think we have to to get over the contracts um, clause problem, um, bankruptcy uniformity only means uniformity from state to state, right? So if a court said, okay, we're going to honor these state priorities, well, that provides you some certainty. It provides you within state uniformity may not be a problem. Really important, I think, and this is one of the reasons I'm so glad I'm here today, is to really learn about the different types of debt, the different ways municipalities borrow. You see a lot, or I've read a lot about you know, so-called um, you know, municipal predatory lending, the sorts of bad debts. Well, you know, in the, in the corporate individual realm, we really don't punish those kinds of creditors. There is a notion of equitable subordination in the bankruptcy code. It's very rarely used. Maybe in the municipal space it should be used more. Are there particular markets we want to protect? I mean, bankruptcy law, for instance, protects the home lending market. You know, a few years ago, you know, so why, why does it do that, you know? Um, but, you know, should we be protecting certain markets? And I think Dan's, um, Dan and Randy's paper is important um, for that. 
I think without some predictability and uniformity, there will always be a distrust of the federal process, and, and that's a problem as states decide what they're going to do. So there needs to be more thought on how the federal process um, can better, res, uh, better reflect the way municipalities, um, in fact, operate. So I'm leaving you 10 more seconds for networking. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, well, good morning. Um, you'll notice I am from Atlanta, so I'd have to take issue with a Carolina's bond lawyer that uh, the economic engine of the Southeast uh, is Atlanta, not Charlotte. And we can uh, debate that over coffee, I guess. Well, the current paper adds to Juliet's extensive work on municipal bankruptcy law. I use her writings and those of a few other law professors to provide a rough sketch of the debate over Chapter 9 provisions and their calls, their collective calls, if you will, for change. They base their work on, as she pointed out in uh, 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 introducing my comments, that uh, they do uh, base their comments on descriptive work and normative principles instead of empirical work. But that approach is understandable because there are so few general purpose uh, municipal bankruptcies to draw upon. So I recognize that. But still, I think because there's not that empirical basis for general purpose municipal bankruptcies, that I don't see the basis for making statutory law change at this time. And she correctly pointed out that the law is always changing in the interpretation. Okay, so chapter nine is often called a fresh start because of its focus on the adjustment of debt. It represents uh, and respects state sovereignty and does not allow interference with the political powers without local consent. Yet the state cannot impose binding plans of adjustment on non-consenting creditors. Now the critics to that point out that the same officials remain in control. It does not change habits or resolve the fragmentation of decision making, nor does it address the root causes such as a declining tax base. But as they point out, states have choices. States can act as a gatekeeper to bankruptcy filing, defining if and under what conditions their local governments can file. We had one empirical paper presented today. I would point to empirical research that was presented two years ago at this conference that does confirm that these laws matter to the market. In addition, states can provide oversight even during bankruptcy, such as through the appointment of an emergency manager, as in Detroit. Chapter 11 allows governance restructuring, also referred to as the efficient reorganization of assets. Chapter 9 does not, which is a reflection of federalism. Still, some authors uh, advocate changes to directly address governance, including the power to resolve fragmentation and to make tax changes. Changes are seen as needed to overcome the undesirable uh, strategic behavior of local officials. Uh, this could even include allowing the court to monitor implementation of the confirmation plan. 
There are calls for more assertion in the rulings on eligibility on the front end and on plan confirmation at the back end, even vetoing the plan until the locals get it right. Thus, proposals call for giving judges more power. I do not see the need for such change. I agree more with Melissa Jacoby at Chapel Hill, who shows that the informal role works quite well, as demonstrated in the Detroit bankruptcy blueprint that I'm sure we'll hear more about this afternoon. It's useful to note that at the same time, the state of Michigan was exercising its oversight function a point consistent with Juliet's uh, federalism coordination perspective. Let me turn to creditor priorities or whose preferences count. Chapter 9 does not follow the property rights path because, as Juliet points out, public assets are not available to creditors. Chapter 11, however, recognizes that a grant of security carries a remedy against the property interest that's pledged. An estate is created of all the debtor's interest in property, and the court oversees a fair and orderly distribution of that property. In contrast, Chapter 9 focuses on what I call contractual claims. Revenue bonds provide contractual security only if there are sufficient revenues going forward. It's non-recourse debt because if revenues are, are insufficient, the creditor gets nothing. Statutory liens, highlighted by Rhode Island, present another form of potential secured claims. An interesting paper by David Skill at the University of Pennsylvania says that such liens are unlikely to be secured if they only spring into action upon insolvency or the filing uh, in bankruptcy. But, he says, if the liens matter outside Chapter 9, then they should be considered secured claims. I call your attention to our paper presented uh, two years ago at this conference that confirmed empirically that statutory liens do matter to the market. Then we get to unsecured claims. Bond lawyers learned that they had to yield to the interpretation of bankruptcy attorneys. We see the result in Detroit's treatment of unlimited tax geos as unsecured. I end with Juliet's uh, asking her to give us more guidance in her paper on what she means by worthy and unworthy unsecured claims and the impact of those categories going forward. Thank you. Time for a few questions from the audience. I'll start with a, a question, maybe more of an observation, and, and Bart, I think you just alluded to it, is uh, the, the market finding some comfort in statutory liens, and I'm, I'm wondering, since, and Dan and I were talking about this last night, the, the public finance legal landscape is a patchwork quilt, and nobody would design it this way if they had a, the so-called clean sheet of paper. So we're... We call that federalism. Yeah, yes. So we're constantly patching this system and trying to, trying to optimize it, which leaves us lots of neat things to, right. to study and lots of neat transactions for bankers to propose. Uh, but I, I wonder why the market isn't proposing better solutions in terms of rate and covenant that would force issuers and force policymakers to maybe be more proactive around legal changes they need to make to reduce creditor uncertainty. Well, well the market does make those 
points uh, every hour, every day of trading. Uh, you, you, you buy what you think is best or what meets your uh, investors' needs. So the market is making those decisions, and it's up to the academics and other researchers to use the data to try to illustrate what the decision makers are doing on a daily basis. And uh, I have to publicly uh, thank the MSRV for making the data available, making a new academic data product available uh, if the SEC approves the rule, uh, because um, we depend on the data to do the research to confirm what the market is actually doing. Yeah, and I, I think that's an interesting point, and I you know, had marked that down about that statutory liens do matter to the market, because also thinking about David Skeel's paper from a year or so ago in the Illinois Law Review, and you know, he was talking about whether these are really liens in the commercial sense, and you know, I wonder myself whether statutory liens are the way to go. I mean, yes, if, if the market uh, responds positively to them, then maybe the answer is yes, but you know, when you talk about a lien, you are talking about partitioning property, and in this case, a flow of um, revenues for one specific purpose, when of course, you know, the, the competing interest that we talk about in municipal finance has always got to be having enough resources so that um, services can be provided, um, you know, the community can be taken care of, and, and so, you know, again, it goes to, and, and maybe I'm getting a little bit too theoretical here, but this property construct that I suppose in a perfect world we should be getting rid of. Yeah, I, I guess my normative view is we should avoid earmarking, but the lien, as Rhode Island and others were looking at, and correct me if I'm wrong, was on all general fund. I mean, so it, yes. it's, it's not earmarking for a road construction. Mm -hmm. That is correct, yep. And, and so uh, my normative view is that we should uh, preserve that general fund window question here? Well, it's not really a question. Uh, I'm an economist. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm uh, Carol O'Clarecon. I'm the deputy mayor of the city of Detroit for economic policy. And it seems to me that you're talking about the pre-bankruptcy situation where you make liens and you do all that. Mm -hmm. What clearly hap has happened in Detroit post-bankruptcy, just to do it, the exit financing, was that there was much discussion between the borrower, that is the city of Detroit, and the state of, New of Michigan, because this was a Michigan credit, um, and the rating agencies and bond council to come up with a number of different ways to guarantee that uh, the flow of money, which was really coming from the state of Michigan to the city of Detroit, uh, would be there in the end. I had, I, I come out of New York. I did right. New York City in 1970s, and also Washington. I had never seen such a detailed uh, and painful, quite frankly, uh, conversation that took place. That nothing was good enough until there was this extra, at least three extra layers of waterfall mm -hmm. to to make sure that. Uh, this money would end up in the right lockbox at the right time to make sure that it would get paid off. So I think that the market, to answer your, this conversation here, I think that the market is doing mm -hmm. uh, precisely what you said, mm -hmm. um, but it's doing it case by case, yes. painfully. And, and, and pay, maybe painfully is the wrong word. Case by case, given the particular situations which means that it suits it. Which is consistent with Juliet's point that the law is changing uh, as we move through, uh, in contrast to my aversion to changing the statutory law of Chapter 9. So, yeah, consistent. I think that's right. Yes, thank you. Ad hoc is not uh, unexpected 
in instances of the kind of sovereignty, shared sovereignty, that we're talking about. And to allude to the other paper that somebody did about what's happening in Europe, the same thing happens right. when you're talking about shared sovereignty, in this case a federal bankruptcy and a state sovereign and, and a state that's trying to protect uh, its own uh, home rule preemption. So exactly. well, you really should be up here right. because of your, your, your background with all of these, that's right. trying to solve all of these problems that the rest of us have created. Yeah. I want to stress, I, I do want to Be careful stress, about that Carolina <laughs> lawyer. <laughs> I, I, I do want to stress something important that you said, though, and it also goes to Bart's comment about that there haven't been very many general purpose municipalities. I mean, you certainly can't generalize. I, you know, I don't think uniformity from state to state city is desirable, but some certainty in how these things are going to be resolved within a state is important, you know, particularly um, going to, to your paper, Dermot, which again, you know, would be so informative to state legislatures because they're the gatekeepers, right? So are we going to let our cities file or is everything just going to blow up? So I think that that's a, an excellent point and thank you for it. We have a question way in the back there. Uh, thank you. Uh, David Byrd, University of Delaware. There's an interesting opportunity here that you talk about, uh, Juliet. Uh, there's probably a reason why states like Florida and North Carolina have not had municipal bankruptcies. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and there's probably a reason why states like uh, California and Alabama have. So uh, it would seem like there was an attempt to take Chapter 11 and make chapter nine, chapter 11, but they ran up against the 10th Amendment. Right. Uh, could you comment on how this could work with uh, putting more emphasis on what the states can do and what the states have done uh, to make this whole thing work in chapter nine? Well, you know, you raise an excellent point that I, I didn't get to, which goes to the whole, first of all, question about federal policy, right? Because when you mention California and Alabama, um, that is where you wonder what bankruptcy is really supposed to do, right? One of the earlier papers talked, and again, it was uh, Dermot Murphy and his co-authors, talked about Chapter 9 states having weak creditor protection. And again, I don't know that that's um, you know, necessarily in the code. Um, in North Carolina, it is my understanding that there's a lot of um, supervision beforehand, right? Same with New Jersey. Um, so, you know, my, I guess my question in you know, designing these state oversight programs, and I, you know, think of, of Pennsylvania Act 47, where you know, they, they do seem to think, okay, you know, maybe bankruptcy might not be the worst thing, but jump all, through all these hoops first, it would certainly give a lot more or lend a lot more certainty to the bankruptcy process if we were clearer, and you know, I, I say we deliberately because I'm not sure who the we is. I mean, I guess you know, it would be the courts on how state-ordered priorities should be dumped into Chapter 9. Right, rather than sort of waffling, and, and I, I don't mean to say Judge Rhodes waffled, I think he did a, a good job on this point, but rather than saying, well, the constitutional priority isn't binding on us in the bankruptcy court, but we're going to respect it somewhat, doesn't give much certainty. So maybe in states that have clear priorities, that have oversight, we say, Okay, you know, the role of Chapter 9 is just close the deal, right? Just solve the holdout problem. Um, you know, fresh start, I mean, you, you, you use that term. It's a term that we use a lot in bankruptcy, but of course, fresh start means you've sold all your property and there you go. And, you know, with, with Chapter 9, we talk about going forward. But you do, and, and I am like a, a lawyer, I'm giving you a non answer, but um, you raise. <laughs> A really important point, because I think what, what those of us who study Chapter 9 from the law side do struggle with 
is what do you do about places like California and Alabama, right? I mean, you know, Clayton Gillette is one that's talked about um, more of a judicial role, and then you, you bump right up against the Tenth Amendment. Um, you know, maybe the answer is don't make Chapter 9 available in those places. You know, if, if you, you can only do Chapter 9 if you have the state intervention first. Um, but it's, it's a really important question, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm not giving you a clear answer to it, but, but you really put your finger on something that is, is very important. I'm going to let uh, Dan be the last, last question. All right, so we have uh, the Carolinas, we have Atlanta. I'm originally from the great state of Texas, and in Texas we have sort of a phrase, you call something a horse and rabbit stew. Uh, the recipe for horse and rabbit stew is, is one horse and one rabbit. Uh, and it tastes like a horse. And uh, as, I, as, I, as, I, as I look at this and think, you know, think about uh, uh, municipalities in distress, I wonder, is, is this kind of a horse and rabbit stew where sort of horse is pensions? Uh, uh, is, that, is that, or is that, is that not, the, I see Juliet is saying yes, Bart's saying no. Um, <laughs> uh, I was, do you care to address that at all? It's a, it's a, it's a, a genuine question, but, uh, but uh, what do, what do we have here? Ladies first. Oh, okay. Um, I, I was going to let you go first. And again, um, <laughs> okay. something that, that, <laughs> that I, I didn't really touch on, but you know, we, we talk about the markets and the different promises that are made and you know, constitutional and statutory promises, and of course that all has to come into the mix. And you know, when, when you talk about fresh start, you know, at some point, you know, something has to be done about these promises that, that were made. And, and um, so, you know, the best I can say on that is, again, thinking about priorities um, and, and how states have, have given pensions priorities comes into this. But I'm more interested in, in what you have to say about how it's not the horse. Sure. Well, the... Uh my understanding is, of course, the in Detroit it was the, uh, the unfunded part of the pension, not the funded part. And the funded part, as someone I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, you know, is up and down. I mean, we had some good years, and it was fully funded. Now they are less funded. So that's that's a cycle of the market. So I, I'm not this. Uh, person that be believes that a 30-year pension horizon is a problem today that we have to hyperventilate about. It is for some jurisdictions. I'm, I, I, uh, I don't know all the details of Detroit, uh, but I come off a, a recent uh, river cruise where I sat down with, uh, my wife and I sat down with another couple, and it happened to be the head of the Teamsters of New York City during the 70s. And he was telling me all the details about how they came to the rescue. And yes, that was the 70s, this is the 2016, but I'm just not a believer in this view that the pensions are the, the problem today. I, I like your sailing analogy that, yes, you might want to start tacking a little bit away, uh, but it's a 30-year horizon. Great. Well, let's leave it at that. Thanks, everybody, for your comments. Thank you.